My name is Peter McLean with DOA Canada, Regional Sales Manager for Atlantic Canada. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to spend with us as we cover houses of worship. We're going to look at how to design these systems as well as component overview. Some of the areas we're going to cover, again, an introduction. Houses of worship is, is definitely a market that some of us have uh, worked in, some haven't. It's definitely a, a tricky area of audio design just because of variance in acoustic uh, the acoustics of the facilities, whether it's square, rectangular, typical rooms, or some of them are very vast, uh, cavernous type of rooms. So we'll look at where to start on this type of facility, venue requirements, some things to think about when looking at these rooms, the right system to match these requirements, POA solutions as they fit in, some configuration tools that can help you out along the way, and we'll finish it off with some uh, application examples to give you some visuals of you know, the full system put together. Where to start? Again, these rooms can sometimes be very difficult to design proper audio for them. Lots of obstacles need to be understood and overcome. You know, they can be very reverberant spaces, the age of the building. There, there is a lot to overcome. We'll cover those uh, particular obstacles. The key to remember is that TOA provides solutions to overcome these obstacles. So as long as we understand what we're being faced with, we can select the right product to overcome those and be sure that the audio will perform properly in these venues. So look at uh, where to start. Attended use. What are these uh, facilities being used for? Is it primarily just speech? Is there some live music in there, combination of both? Is it choir? Is it organ going through the audio system? Is there a live band? So it's key to understand, you know, how these uh, rooms are being used. Reverberant space. Pay attention to the reverberance in these rooms. Sometimes they can be very, uh, very reverberant, whether it's controlled or uncontrolled. Maybe they do have some acoustic treatment on on the on the sides and walls and, and things like that, which is key to understand. Mounting options. You know, where the speakers can be mounted. A lot of times, ideally, <laughs> sonically and design-wise, where we want these speakers to go. Visually, that's not an option. So it's good to have a good look around and see, you know, where can I mount these uh, particular speakers? Because aesthetics is key. Uh, the visuals, you know, are they uh, in the way of windows or things like that? It's definitely important to, to look at where and where we cannot put these certain speakers as we as we decide which one will, will fit the need. A is the building. Definitely something to pay attention. If it's an older building, you definitely have to look at where and how you're going to route your cable and your speakers. Some older buildings, you know, do have asbestos, so we have to worry about issues with asbestos and, and try to avoid abatement of, of asbestos. So you may have to have provisions for wire mold and, and things like that to keep the, the cables above or outside of the walls. The variance in, in usage and the amount of, of the group attending. Sometimes these facilities, facilities will be quite full at a certain times of the year. Sometimes the congregation may be a little bit small, so we have to take that in, in consideration. Again, you know, in a full room, uh, people do absorb sound, so you know that may affect the audio settings compared to other times of the year where maybe it's 30% full. So again, the acoustic properties will differ at that point. Who will be operating the system? You know, do they have an AV or audio guy within the congregation that's going to control the system uh, when in use, or is it the pastor or priest that wants a little bit of control, that type of thing, where maybe a, a keypad and, and simple volume control or control of a few mics may be a better solution. Budget range. You know, it is key to look at the budget range and how we can design this system and work within that. You know, maybe they can't afford a full-blown system to cover you know, perfect audio coverage. So maybe, maybe we have to look at that in stages and say, okay, let's start with the front end of the main speakers, make sure we have the proper elements and, and components in there to allow them to expand as the budget allows. Common venue requirements, again, as mentioned, you know, speaker, uh, voice intelligibility with the speaker or any kind of solo vocalist, even coverage, front side rows, look at balconies above or below, dynamic range, you know, is it just uh, a person speaking or is there a band? So that, that tells us, you know, whether we have to add larger speakers for low frequency or potentially subwoofers, depending on the facility. Ease of operations, definitely key. Do we have to make sure we have auto mixing uh, in the DSP side of things and in the head end? Do they need remote controls, that type of thing, to, to make adjustments? 
meaning the large spaces, you know, hard services, reverberant environment, distance to rear, you know, it's definitely key to, to, to pay attention to all those points as well as, you know, have the measurements and distance from the front of the facility to the rear as well as your, your elevation. Architectural obstacles, columns, alcoves, windows, uh, things like that. Distance, you know, limited distance from the mics to the speakers and, and pay attention to those points. As well as the audience. Are they older, hearing impaired, things like that? Do we have to have provisions for an output to feed an assistive hearing or uh, listening device? Will they be sitting, standing, kneeling? Again, that tells us you know, where we have to throw the sound to. Also, pay attention to additional feeds for monitors for, for again, if they do have a band or choir that needs to hear themselves well up on, at the front of the church or house of worship. Outlining areas, is there overflow areas? Do they need outputs? Are they hosting uh, it on the web, uh, on the website? Do they need to uh, have an output for PC for recording? Some things that you definitely have to pay attention to so we make sure we pick the, the correct head end. Reflected sound. Sound ba bounces all over the place. So it's one thing to, to, to be aware of this and how the sound will work and, and act within a room. Again, you know, by sound bouncing all over the area, that's your reverberance within that room. And that can definitely take you away from intelligibility. So definitely be aware and look around and, and do some tests on the, the, uh, the reverberance within that room and pay good attention to it. A lot of the ways we avoid the, uh, and the primary, uh, primarily, uh, the product we use to avoid reverberance and keep it to a minimum in a facility is using line arrays and a line array speaker. What is a line array? Well, a line array is a system made up of a number of identical drivers uh, located in a vertical array. So you have drivers up and down in a vertical array. This creates a, a near line source of sound. Uh, these speakers are identically spaced as you go up through the line array. And by having a line array, by having these, this vertical array of speakers, it collapses the dispersion above and below the speaker. So we can definitely control the dispersion above and below, which is, uh, is desirable in these large rooms where we want to keep sound away from the ceiling. Nobody's sitting and flying up the top of these facilities and these houses of worship, so there's no sense throwing sound there. So the line array will help us control where we're putting the sound depending on the style of, uh, of line array we choose. So a side shot of, uh, of a standard speaker up above compared to a line array below. As you can see, we're looking at the sides, so we're seeing how waves can potentially come up from this vertical dispersion of a speaker. So we have the intended audience, per se, the, this gentleman here, looking all dapper directly in front of the speaker. So he's getting direct sound. Then he's getting sound that's, you know, basically bouncing off the ceiling, arriving behind his ears. Also sound hitting the ceiling, arriving in front of his ears in the same scenario below. So he's getting sound hitting his ears at various times because of the, the reverberation and, the, and how the sound waves are bouncing off the walls. So it's very uncontrolled and unpredictable. So you can have poor bass uh, or extreme bass depending how these, sound, these waves interact together. And also because uh, the sound waves are bouncing all over the place, you have a more chance uh, of feedback within that room because the sound is bouncing all over and can potentially bounce right back to the microphone. The best scenario and the best part to look at to alleviate some of these issues is a line array speaker. So again, because the line array focuses on direct sound and basically uh, minimalizes vertical dispersion depending on the style of line array, you have direct sound going through your ear. So you're going to have a tighter dispersion. It's going to improve performance base and low frequency as well as minimalize feedback issues. We've covered most of that, you know, wide line arrays, but again, to recap that, better control of dispersion for, uh, versus conventional line arrays, increase of speech intelligibility. And they are easily scalable and configurable for different size and shape venues. So there are uh, a wide variance in line, array, uh, line arrays that are out there, and we'll cover some of the TOA solutions uh, in a few slides from here. Also, minimalized susceptibility to acoustic feedback, which is very key. So looking at, at speakers and where they're, they're put in, a, a, in these types of rooms, we have line arrays focused directly out. You could have, if were, you know, these uh, diagrams are above 
the room looking down, and we have this would be the front of the room. So we have a left and right configuration of a speaker and their coverage. Uh, keep in mind this area you may have a little bit of addition or subtraction of the sound depending on how the waves interact. This would be a single point speaker flown in the center of the uh, of the room, usually used in high ceiling spaces uh, to cover the area. And we also have side fill speaker scenarios as well to fill and maybe pews down uh, further down in, in the room. Sometimes you may have, you know, one scenario would fill depending on the size of the venue of these, and this is where this, you know, you may get away with a left and right speaker depending on the room. More than often, uh, you're going to deal with a combination of these. So it could be line arrays, left and right in the room, and then side fills going down. So, uh, uh, you know, we deal with some flexibility. We'll look at a typical room here, uh, which is a square room with pews going down the side. So we have our left and right main speakers, and then we have fills going on, uh, down the left and right filling in from there. So this would be a combination scenario. Speaker delay. This is one thing you definitely have to pay attention to, and a common issue in houses of worship, whether it's an older system or a newer system. Sound moves at 342 meters per second or 1,120 feet. So that's the delay of sound through air. So multiple speakers will cause negative reverb effect, uh, effects. So if we have speakers at the front of a room and then we have side fills going down the left and right of the room, those speakers uh, down further are going to have a delay uh, in how the sound comes out. Or the, if you're sitting in the rear of the, the room, then you're going to have a delay from the, the sound coming from the speaker at the front of the room. But the speaker to the left in the fill, that's going to get your ear a little bit quicker. So that's going to create issues in these facilities, and you have to pay a lot of attention to this. This can be corrected, uh, you know, as long as you understand that it exists. It can be uh, corrected by aligning the speakers uh, using a DSP, so your digital signal processor, your head-end processing unit should have output delay functionality. So, you know, once we know the distance uh, of the speakers from the certain source, we can we can uh, and that's what brings us into the next slide. On the left-hand part of your screen, you'll see your distance in feet and the delay in milliseconds based upon you know, this, uh, this known fact above. So at 20 feet in distance, you're dealing with 17.9 milliseconds. Up to the high end, 180 feet, 160 milliseconds delay. On the left, we'll show uh, it's a little bit of a screenshot within one of our DSP processors where you would enter your distance and then it'll work out the delay from there. So each output is for your output banks of speakers, depending on their delay from from the initial source. Very key that this is set up, and that, you know this can really make or break your system uh, in these houses of worship. So we've got a little bit about line arrays. Uh, we'll go through our TOA offering here quickly. Uh, uh, in order to uh, give you an idea of where these fit within a, within an application. On the left, we have our SRH Slimline Array Series. There's four versions here. There's This would be a single stack. Uh, there's also a double stack available, so double the size of the column. In addition, we have a 20-degree dispersion below. And you'll see the speaker has a bit of a curve to it. So below, it does give you 20 degrees dispersion below vertically, but above is flat, so you don't get dispersion above there. We also have versions that are straight, so it'd be zero degrees above and below the speaker. These are comprised of 2.8 inch drivers and a vertical array. They're a full range driver and designed primarily for speech, not as much for music. You're not going to be pumping your pipe organ through here or uh, a bass drum or a bass. It, it, it's mainly for, for, for speech lift. These can be used primarily in the front of the church or they can be used as side fills. And it could be a combination where you have larger speakers up front and use these slim line arrays as your delay fills down the side of the room. To the right of that, we have our SRS series of line arrays. These are four-inch drivers uh, with one-inch tweeter arrays going down the side. And they are available in two configurations, zero degree dispersion above and below or 10 degree below. And these can be mounted and stacked together as well. To the right, we have our popular HX5 series of line arrays. So this would be one HX5, but each one of these boxes here, which uh, which encompasses an HX5, is adjustable at 15 degrees. 
So depending on the room, we can adjust where we're putting that sound, depending how we're hanging these speakers. And we can have up to four of these HX5s in an array, so very uh, customizable. To the right, we have our SRD8, which is a, a new speaker uh, with TOA. And this is a steerable line array. So it's based similar to our SRS series, but it is an active powered speaker. It does have DSP to control the dispersion. So this is highly configurable line array. So we can play and adjust the dispersion of this speaker. And in houses of worship, sometimes we're dealing, as I mentioned earlier, with, uh, with older facilities where we're really limited to where we can put the speaker. Uh, maybe it's, it's because asbestos in the walls or the heritage building, we can't you know, drill or make any changes to the aesthetics. So we're stuck with pre you know, preset speaker locations. So with a steerable line array, we can adjust that coverage pattern to throw the sound where we need to. So it's important that you would contact us, uh, our technical design team, and help on that. But you know, they can offer a lot of solutions where you're limited to speaker placement. In addition, below, we have our FB120 sub. So again, if they're looking to add a little bit more power to the system, and they do have a live fan that, that works uh, during the, their, their functions, then this will add some low and frequency to that, so it's a 12-inch driver. To the right, we have the HS1200. This is, there's also an HS1500 monitor. So this is a 12- or 15-inch driver with a tweeter line array. Most commonly, these are used as monitors in, in this type of application. Moving forward, we'll go to the amplifiers. And there's some options here from TOA, which is our DA series of amplifier. DA series is a digital amplifier as opposed to an analog amplifier. So they are, they are very efficient. And that's really important uh, in a couple of factors. Is one is environmentally, you know, they can be left on. They have very low idle current control. And because of that design, uh, they, are, they have a small form factor. So, that, you know, this is one rack space for, for the first unit, single rack space, and a dual rack space. I'll go into the specs and the power that options that we do have uh, going forward. We do have two-channel and four-channel versions. Looking at the efficiency of a digital amplifier versus uh, a conventional amplifier, down below we'll see, based upon output, the efficiency. So at 100% output, we're about you know 4 to 50% efficiency out of the amplifiers. So this would be what we call maybe a Class A or AB amplifier. When we get into a Class D amplifier, the efficiency goes way up. So at 100%, you're looking at, you know, in between 80 to 90% efficiency. So it's more of what we say a green amplifier. And, and again, in this day of age, you're trying to conserve uh, energy. You know, if it is, the system is left on running most of the time, you know, it definitely would come into play. Looking at the specs of these amplifiers, the DA250D is a uh, low impedance amplifier, so 250 watts at 4 ohm. 170 at 8 ohm. We do have a 70 volt version below, which is the DA250DH, which is 250 watts at 70 volt, or 100, or sorry, 500 watts bridge at 140 volt. Next, you drop down to the DA250F, which is again a low teens version, but a four channel. So we have four times 250 watts, 8 ohms, four times 178 8 ohms, or we can bridge those channels together and get 500 watts at 8 ohms per pair output, so that would be two channels at 500 watts. Comparable version in a 70 volt uh, model, which is a DA250FH, four times 250, 70 volt, or bridge together two times 500 at 140 volt. Next down is a DA500FHL, which has configurable outputs, so we have a 70 volt or 8 ohm option within this one amplifier, so four times 500 watts at 70 volt, two times 1,000 watts in bridge mode, four times 550 at 8 ohm, four times, uh, sorry, that should be 1,000 at uh, 4 ohm, I believe, and two times 1,116 ohms. A little bit of typo there. And the DA550, four times four, and, uh, sorry, four times 550, three times 350, or two times 1,100. So lots of options when it comes to the amplifier. The uh, aforementioned line arrays. We'll next move into DSP, digital signal processors. So now we're getting to the head end side of things, and some key things to look at that that can that can uh, improve your system. 
This is functionality that, that is key to bring up uh, when uh, presenting a system to the client. And it's definitely key to make sure that the in in installers are trained on how to set up some of the, you know, the, the functions of the DSP. It's one thing to get the system going and passing signal, but there's a lot of settings in there that can really you know, improve and take the system to the next level. Some of those, uh, the functionality uh, are included here, and we'll start with the list, it is a compressor. Often we get complaints in any kind of public speaking scenario where you have two different speakers coming up, uh, people speaking to the crowd. It could be in the congregation here in this application. And there's the dynamics of those people. So you could have an older lady who is more of a quiet, soft-spoken person and a larger man that may be very dynamic and a higher dynamic. So a compressor, when set correctly, is basically going to equalize the range from the lower dynamic person speaking to a higher dynamic person speaking and give a constant output. This is key in setting up where maybe there's no operator in this house of worship and you want to make sure that you know the, the output is always consistent because there's no one there to turn up and turn down depending on how someone speaks. And again, sometimes uh, a speaker will get closer to the microphone, sometimes they're more intimidated and stand back. So it's key to deal with compression on the input side of, of your signal or your mixer. A limiter works very similar to a compressor, but it limits more of the peaks in the uh, of the signal. A lot of time, a limiter is used on the output of the DSP, feeding the amplifiers. So this can limit the output going to the amplifier. So if you have people, various people using the system, they can't damage the amplifiers or the speakers by you know putting too much signal out. Also, part of, of the functionality in the DSP is a gate. So think of a gate as a as an automatic on and off of that channel, whether it's a line level signal, more importantly used in microphones. So how it works is that you know, when properly set up, it'll it'll sense a certain uh, dB level signal going in, so someone beginning to talk on that certain channel, and automatically turn that signal path on. Once the the gate notices, hey, I don't have that necessary dB level or loudness level, it'll shut off. So if you have multiple microphones on a stage in the front of a church or house of worship and they're all on, they're more susceptible to feedback. So by having them properly gated, it's going to turn those mics on when someone uses it and put the signal through it and turns it on when they're not. So you get a, a cleaner output, less hiss, and less chance of feedback. So it's definitely important to set up the gates properly. Getting the DSPs, uh, you'll have sections of uh, PQ, parametric uh, equalization, to let you really contour and adjust the sound of each input and output. Also in the DSP will be speaker PEQs for most of the TOA line arrays. And this may be you know, the type of speaker being used, or maybe whether it's used with or without a subwoofer, that type of thing. As mentioned before, output delay is crucial in designing systems here in houses of worship. So you will have output delays uh, on the uh, DSP uh, to configure your delay speakers from the front to the rear of the house worship. Some DSPs will have feedback suppression. This is really key. Definitely you get to set it up the design to have the speakers in the proper placement, microphones in the proper placement, your gates active and so on, but there are chances of feedback uh, if someone does walk around through this space. So certain uh, DSPs will have feedback suppression where they'll sense that acoustic frequency that you're getting that high pitched squeal and automatically drop down that pinpoint frequency. Once the system realizes, okay, it's no longer feeding back and, and growing within the uh, the area, then it'll, it'll put the, that frequency back to its normal state. So it is a nice functionality to have uh, in a tricky spot if you've done everything you can in your design and placement of your speakers and choosing the right speaker, just that other layer of, uh, of uh, comfort that you're going to reduce your feedback. We mentioned that uh, some of these rooms, because of age or just this, how they were designed, uh, can be acoustically challenging. And this is another uh, great tool that TOA has designed, the R control, acoustic resonance control, that can be set up and configured, which will basically analyze and throw noise through the system in your initial setup. And you'll have basically a microphone that will read uh, the sound coming back through the room with delays and things like that and the reverberance in the room and automatically equalize and play with phasing of your speakers to have better intelligibility within that potential room. And it makes a world of difference in some of these tricky environments. Also, your DSP 
may include key back controls, so you can add uh, a keypad up in the in the front of the, of the of the church or house of worship, where you can basically turn overall volume up and down, change potential scenes depending on how many people are in uh, the audience and how many people aren't. Because again, uh, if you have a full church, you know we do absorb sound, but sometimes if that church goes down to one third full, then there's a lot more reverberance. So maybe we have settings depending on how many people are are, are present as well as lockout functionality, so you can lock out the DSP, so if various people do uh, have access to the uh, the audio system, you can limit it to what they are allowed to change. Maybe it's just input microphone volumes and that's it, or no control at all. So that way the system isn't defeated or can't be compromised. Uh, uh, next we'll look at these DSP options that TO has. And we do have a wide range of DSP options here. We'll start on the left, our M633D. This is a, a single rack style mixer. Uh, the front of it is something that most facilities are used to, conventional knobs. Uh, looks like an analog mixer, but actually it is a digital mixer. Inside the processing is digital, so it has a lot of the advantages that a digital processor uh, brings to the table. An overall functionality of it is this nine channel inputs, six mic, three stereo line inputs, four output channels, which is comprised of two balanced, one line and one record outputs. So these outputs can be uh, configured. It could be you know left, right, and a sub, or it could be uh, left, right, and maybe an overflow room. So you can configure it on this particular unit. It does have our uh, very powerful acoustic resonance control functionality built in for tricky rooms. So even in more of, a, in our line, a more of a mid to entry level type piece, it does offer a lot of power in, uh, in functionality and processing. Also includes feedback expression control, uh, automatic clip gear function, and automatic mute. So in your, your small to maybe some mediums, uh, the, the, this is a, a good mixture depending on the inputs you need. For a facility, lots of power on the, uh, on the with the R control and feedback suppression. It's not set up via PC. It's push button, so very simple to set up uh, on that side of things in a very powerful unit. Next, we have our M9000 series, which has been out for numerous years. This is the latest version, the M2. So this is a modular design, as opposed to the M633, where all the inputs are available you do have to populate this depending on what your requirements are. So you're allowed up to eight input channels, mic or line on this particular unit, and eight output on this as well. And it is configurable. So if you only need four inputs, then you add uh, two input cards, which are basically two inputs per card. So it's configurable on, in, in a matter of groups of two on your input and output stage. Lots of signal matrixing on this particular unit. You can configure it via the front panel, but it's a lot harder to do that than it is to connect it to your PC via RS-232 setup. And that's where I advise most of the setup and programming be done on this particular unit. Crossover functionality, so there's uh, options there to add a sub and, and control what frequencies are going to what output. Vast amount of parametric EQs and speaker EQs. This is where we start to get in the compressor, limiter, and gates of all your inputs and outputs. You can add keypads to it, lockouts, and you'll see one of the keypads below. And a lot of our keypads, we do have uh, a wide variety available. And this particular keypad could be various scenes and an overall volume, or it could be certain inputs that you want to select on or off at a certain period of time. And this particular unit does offer the functionality of speaker delays, where the M633 does it. Moving up the chain here, we have our M864D. So the M864D does have the look and feel with the fader type control on the front of the unit, but it is digital. It is a digital processed uh, DSP. Based upon 15 input channels, 8 mic, 7 stereo lines, 5 output channels, 4 balance, and 1 record output. It does offer uh, men's signal processing, PEQ, uh, arc resonance control built into it, feedback suppression, more of an advanced feedback suppression than mentioned earlier on the 633, automatic clip guard, automatic muting, compression limiters, gates, keypads. 
It does have a very uh, impressive live software control. So again, if you make changes on the live software, which uh, which is nice, it, it'll come up on the unit itself. So it's live control. It is networkable. So if any modifications need to, to be made, you know, if it's if set up on the network and you have access to that uh, remotely, you can play around and configure this unit. So it is, it is a very nice and powerful and probably our most popular in, in meeting the large style houses of worship at this point. Adding on to that in a larger facility, this is this is nice when you're dealing with you know not too large of a church because uh, of uh, not you know no need for delay outputs. But when you need a little more control of the facility for with delays going back through the pews and maybe balconies and things like that we can add the DPSP3. So this is an advanced speaker controller. It's not meant to, uh, uh, to be the main processing of the unit. It's meant to add on to something like the M864. So it has two inputs and six outputs, and this can be six various output delays. So this offers an advanced speaker delay uh, uh, setup, which is very nice to, to, to get in and make sure that you're time aligning your system. It does offer additional advanced crossover control additional uh, equalization, and additional compressor limiter and gates. Also, as, as similar with the M864, it is networkable. So a lot of times you'll see these two used together in a design of your typical house of worship. We'll touch upon microphones. That's the next stage. So we've covered our speaker style, we've covered amplifiers, options for DSP. Now we're plugging in some sources and microphones. There's two types of microphones available out there. Generally, is a dynamic style and a condenser style. So, a dynamic style microphone is a high SPL handling microphone. So, you know, if you're putting a speaker in front of a kick drum or a bass amp, generally it's going to be a dynamic style. They are a little bit more durable to use, and therefore dropping and things like that. Generally, more inexpensive and less affected by temperatures. Now, a dynamic microphone does not require power to work. So uh, you may have heard of phantom power and that type of thing, uh, and you may see that on, you should see that on most mixing boards and DSPs and things like that. This does not require power to work. The other style is a condenser, and a condenser style does require this phantom power to work. The advantage by uh, conventional microphones is higher sensitivity to a dynamic, so it's more sensitive to picking up sound. So when we talk about using it in a house of worship where you may have a microphone further from your from the mouth and the person speaking, the condenser is better at picking up that intended audio. They tend uh, the negative sides they tend to be a little more fragile at drops, so they're not as robust as the neck microphones if they do get a little bit you know a little bit of use to them. They have a lower handling noise. As mentioned, they do require phantom power. The very big key if, if you're using a condenser microphone plugging it into an audio system and for some reason the microphone doesn't work, you know, it could be a condenser microphone to be sure that the phantom power is turned on on that channel of your mixer or your DSP. Generally, a condenser microphone that tends to be a little bit more expensive than dynamic because you are getting that higher sensitivity uh, to that and a water dynamic range. When we get in uh, to, to microphones, there's only two types of pickup pick patterns, and this is how and where the sound of the mic where the microphone picks up audio. First, we're looking at an omnidirectional microphone. So, as you can see, you've got your microphone right here, and you've got a spherical 360 degree pickup pattern. So, it picks up sound from all directions equally around the microphone. So, if you're in front of the microphone here, it's picking up here. If you're talking to the back of the microphone, it's picking up here. One issue with this style of microphone is if there's a speaker behind here, sometimes you're going to get there, you're, you may get feedback. So they're more susceptible to feedback because they do pick all the way around the microphone. The advantage of them is in the style of maybe uh, you know I, a microphone that may be uh, a lavalier style pinned on you is that they'll pick up the sound from above or below and that type of thing depending on where you're mounting your microphone on your dress. So there's pros and cons of an Omni style microphone depending on how it is being used. Another style is a unidirectional microphone. 
So these are designed for best response in front of the microphone. So compared to the last slide, you have full pickup pattern in front, but it, you do have rear rejection. So these are less susceptible to feedback. I find that a lot of times in houses of worship, the Omni are a little bit better choice because these, these are very reverberant rooms. The sound does reflect around. So having the rejection to the rear of the microphone is, is key. Definitely uh, important when, when reducing chances of feedback in, in, in these very tricky rooms. Getting into microphones, more, uh, more importantly, I guess we're talking about wireless microphones. We'll do a coverage uh, of the, the technology behind wireless microphones. All wireless microphones are not created equal. And the offering that TOA has when it comes to wireless microphones, which is quite vast. So TOA, wire, TOA wireless products can operate at multiple uh, frequencies. And this, this is key depending on where this facility is, if it's a, a downtown core, Calgary or Vancouver or Montreal, Toronto, where there could be a lot of radio frequencies around, the more frequencies, the better. Maybe in rural com uh, communities it may, be, it may not be as important, but there are different options depending on frequencies required. Looking at receiver types, there's various types, which, uh, which you'll see in blue here, which is diversity, space diversity, and true diversity. Uh, Multipath of signal uh, consideration is important as sound, you know, RF does bounce around and move around rooms. Uh, so, you know, wireless products can bounce off walls and sometimes be penetrated depending on the, uh, the design build of, of the facility and the penetration through walls and whether they do bounce around. Looking at the microphone style, as I first mentioned, is diversity style. So diversity receivers I uh, may have two antennas, uh, as you'll see below, but they'll only have one tuner. So they'll have one tuner connected to one or two antennas. So this particular system uh, doesn't have any processing or anything like that. It's got two antennas that are constantly picking up the signal at different distances because, you know, RF does is, is waves, and, and depending how the waves move around the room, the signal may be stronger at this antenna than that antenna. But there's no intelligence in behind this to say which is stronger, which is not. If we, uh, when we're talking about, as, as you can see here, multicasting and things like that, you can have dropouts in, in, in wireless microphones, we know. They work similar to like a cordless phone. You could be walking through your house and walk from one room to another room, and you have dropout. And that's where that signal doesn't have great coverage in there. So that is something to pay attention when you get into wireless microphones. In this particular scenario, there's no processing in this receiver to say this is stronger than that, than that antenna. So it's more of the entry level style that will have this type of diversity built into. The next step up to that is space diversity. So in a space diversity style of wireless receiver, you have two antennas. Uh, which are not connected as they were in the previous slide. They are separately mounted here to a switch or a comparator circuit. So, and then you, beyond that, you have one tuner. The one tuner is doing a comparison between these two antennas, uh, which signal is, is better. So it's monitoring the RF and adjusting to which antenna it thinks is better. Definitely uh, a better option than having no comparator at all and no intelligibility in your receiver. But the odd time you still may run into to drop it because it's kind of a, a blind switch between the two from the, from the tuner side of things. So a space diversity wireless receiver would be middle of the road. The top style of wireless receiver and the one I most commonly suggest uh, in house wars is true diversity. So true diversity systems have two unconnected and separate antennas. So you have your two uh, antennas and then you have two antenna uh, tuners that are receiving that signal. Then you have the comparator circuit, which is on the other side of the tuner. So it's an intelligent switch. It, it, it can tell which tuner has the, the strongest signal, less, uh, less amount of interference, and switches to that. So depending uh, where the microphone is and if, if the person is moving around within this room, it will automatically switch to these two tuners so you don't get dropouts. 
And when it switches between these two, you very rarely notice it. So it reduces noise, uh, any interference, and offers a more reliable wireless coverage pattern within these rooms. Again, when it comes to house of worship, you know, uh, speech is imperative there. You know, uh, the spoken word, you know, what's being portrayed to the audience. So this is one area where you don't want to uh, cheapen out in your design. You know, I, I would always suggest using a true diversity microphone in any house of worship application. Looking at the TOA offering for wireless microphones, we'll start out with our Trantec series, our top in line of wireless. So this is a true diversity unit. It is designed for speech and performance. There are options for a lavalier style microphone and handheld style microphone. We do have good spacing between the frequencies so they don't interact. Die cast housing, so it's a robustly constructed microphone, so you have die cast housing on the transmitter pack and the handheld style pack. LCD display on both units when, it talk, uh, when you're looking at battery life or frequency changing. Very easy to programming. Uh, it can be done via software or it can be done uh, via an IR window here as well. As I mentioned, there is software available that you can monitor RF strength and so on of the transmission. You have controls for mic sensitivity, options for XLR quarter inch output of the unit. Maximum of 240 channels available. So again, in those congested, uh, congested RF areas, you have lots of flexibility of picking your channel of, of the operate. This unit, uh, I don't believe I mentioned here, does have frequency scanning too, and the mid to high T offering will allow you to do that, where it'll scan the area and come back with a suggested frequency you should set your unit to which is very nice in the setup. Make sure you pay attention to that. When setting up your wireless microphone and don't just turn them on, take a frequency and go. Uh, allow it to do uh, and utilize that, pro that program inside, which will pick the, the, the strongest frequency to use. So generally, as a rule of thumb, we can offer about 24 of these in, in one scenario, or one application, one facility. Works off one, or sorry, yeah, one AA battery, and they are available in various kits. From there, we have the TOA 5000 series. They are available in pre-configured kits as well as individual components. We're at 16 channels here, uh, and 16 times 4 channel units are available. Lots of options for microphones, handheld, lavalier, headsets, aerobic options, and we'll touch, uh, touch upon those in a few more slides. They are available in both space and true diversity versions. That They do as well have channel searching, squelch control, here we're looking at 16 maximum units used in one facility. A new addition to this lineup is we now have charging bays available for these microphones. So instead of uh, having to wonder you know, whether the mic was left on and the battery's dead or not, uh, there are cradles so you, you know, in, the, in, the, in the house wars they can just drop their microphone into it at the end of the day and you know they're going to be charged the next time they're needed. Up to 120 meters of operation, Mic sensitivity control and removable antennas. So breaking down these receivers within the line, drilling a little bit further into it, our WT 5800 and 5805. The 5800 is true diversity, and the uh, the 5810 is sorry, it should be a 5805 is space diversity. Do after channel scanning, attachable antennas, LCD control. The main difference between these two, the 5805 and the 5800, is true diversity or space diversity. We have the WT5820, which is space diversity, uh, but you can, you basically this is a frame and then you add the tuners to it, so this can handle two microphones off one chassis unit. Uh, you can mix that or have separate outputs, so you can have two separate channel outputs going into your mixture or combine them together which is a nice solution if the existing mixer or, or, or input at this facility only has one extra channel and you need to, eat, need to add two microphones. So this has a you know, very simplistic mixer functionality in it to, to feed one input channel. Next we have our WT5810, which is a space diversity unit. Uh, it does have some channel scanning in there, you know, a little bit limited channels going down. 
and there are kits available for the WT5810. One thing to keep in mind is these are not removable in tennis. When it comes to the microphone side of things, some options here starting at the WM5270. Performance style microphone, dynamic version. Before we mention types of uh, microphones, omni mount and uni mount, this is a cardioid, so this is the uh, classified under the uni uh, coverage style of microphone. So it does have rejection at the rear and good coverage in the front. So cardioid is based on a heart style scenario where you have the heart going up like this. So less susceptible in the rear of feedback. The 5265, again, it's a dynamic performance base, but it's omni mount. So or, I keep saying omni mount, omni directional, my mistake. Uh, so it picks up 360 degrees in front and behind. This may be used, you know, if, if you want a portable microphone in the center of a choir, something like that that you can move around. So depending where people are standing, you put this in the center of a choir, and it'll pick up all the way around. That could be a good application for this omni-style pickup pattern. Moving down, we have the WM5225. This is geared more for speech, uh, and it is a condenser style of microphone. So, you know, if you have, uh, if you may not be right in front of the microphone and have a little bit of distance on the microphone, it's going to be more sensitive to picking up the intended source. It is a cardio as well, so you have rear projection. Rear rejection, sorry. Uh, so a little bit less successful feedback. And next we have the 5325. This is a transmitter pack. This isn't a microphone. You would add a microphone to this, and we'll cover those styles next. So this is more the transmitter style, which is built into these units. So in addition to that transmitter style belt pack, we have some options uh, to add on the microphone side, starting at the w sorry ypm5300 a lavalier style microphone condenser and a cardio so less susceptible to feedback yp5310 a lavalier condenser on mount so again it's going to pick up more around the area but a little more susceptible to feedback in house of worship i, I tend to go with a, a condenser style just because it, it, it does have that rejection of feedback those characteristics em77 it's a very nice slim style microphone behind the ear. So it's slim, goes over the ear, it's condenser, condenser omni, uh, omni type pickup pattern. So this would go around the ear and this would go right in front of the mouth and the mouth area. So you may, you'll see this style of microphone used, you know, in sporting events, TSN, football games, that type of thing, because it, it gets the microphone closer to the mouth, closer to the source. It's not obtrusive, it's very comfortable wearing and blends in nicely. Probably one of our more popular microphones when it comes to houses of worship. And we have our EM22 head worn style, so it goes around the head and around the ears, uh, and it's cancer style and omni mount. So uh, quite similar, just a little bit more in, in how it mounts to your head. A lot of times, depending on, on the person using it and their comfort factor between these two, will dictate which one uh, may be the proper selection. Antenna distribution. One thing to pay attention uh, in, in House of Worship or, or any facility for that matter is where your microphone receivers, as I mentioned, are mounted. And you know, something that a lot of times may be overlooked. Generally, the, the equipment is going to be in a separate room and not going to be sitting out in plain view uh, in the worship area of the facility. So the head end may be one room away, maybe in a basement, you know, it all depends on the application. So it's key to have antennas within the room you're operating. So when distance is an issue, uh, you know, you definitely want to add remote antennas. So the, the WD-4800 is a remote antenna. You would use two of these located in a room. It's coax cable, like an RG6 that would run back to an antenna uh, distributor depending on the size of your system, or maybe just back to the wireless receivers themselves in, the cha in, in, in maybe the 5000 series where you can loop antennas together. So you'd have two of these antennas uh, in the, uh, the main worship room and going back to the head end. So it allows you to increase 
and, and guarantee coverage of the wireless receivers when you have the head end located at a further point where it may be going through walls or floors or ceilings and that type of thing. So we've kind of covered most of the main key ingredients in looking at a, a house of worship and, and, and paying attention in the gear that can, can create the proper solution. So I just have a few more slides here before we conclude which show typical scenarios uh, of some facilities. This is a house of worship, maybe smaller size, uh, speech only. Uh, but it could have music as well. We're dealing with SRSs as your main fronts. Or you could use HX5s going back to a single, or sorry, this is a four-channel amplifier. That's your power. Moving back to your DSP, which is your 9000 series, which is a maximum of eight inputs and outputs. Includes all your processing. You've added a keypad here, which allows some local control of volume or maybe source selection. And then your wireless microphones that connect to those. So, you know, that, that encompasses a system. We also look at and pay attention to the outputs of this. Uh, potentially here, maybe we only need a couple outputs, but be in mind, you may need an output to feed overflow zones or a computer or some kind of recording device. In a larger type scenario with speech, uh, we could, could be looking at our slimline arrays. Uh, these could be in various wings left and right of the main stage. So we may need to fill a wider range up front. And a little bit more power handling may be required here because we're powering out and maybe an organ through it or something such as that. Bigger power amplifier, the DA500 or 550 style. That's going back to a DSP. Uh, VPSP3. The reason we add this is you'll notice we also have some delays here. Uh, actually, the typo here it should be the SRHs, but sometimes you may use uh, a smaller box style as well. So they're powered from a secondary amplifier. We have our DA could be four channel or two channel, depending on what the requirements are and how many delays we have. So once we get into delays here, we know we need a DSP uh, that has delay outputs, which is what we have here. And then that's said back to our main mixer DSP, which is the 864 here, which has our input channels, equalization, compressor limiter gates, and so on. And our microphones feed into this. When we get into medium or large, maybe we're doing a cluster style with A6Is, which are configurable. And we're adding our, some subsystems, some bottom end. Maybe there is a, a, a live band, drums, or, or a keyboard bass that has to be fed through the system as well as just each bigger amplifier here as well. And we also notice that we have delay fills here going down. It could be three sets of these, four sets of these. They have their own amplifier included. And again, we know when we're getting into delays, we've got to make sure our DSP... Uh, whether it's the main DSP or a secondary DSP has some delay configurability to it. So we have a DPSP3 here as well, and again, our M864 and our sources. Yes. This encompasses maybe a larger house of worship. H65 is in the front, some good bottom end, fills down the side to, to be sure that uh, we have proper coverage within the, uh, within the facility.